My name is Steve Ozug. I'm the Vice President of Students here at Bristol Community College, but I also lead the college's emergency planning and preparedness team. Just a little background and a little history as to how we got to this point. Although the college has had an emergency plan and a preparedness plan for a very, very long time, which was updated on a regular basis, last winter the college recommitted itself and recommitted its efforts and the appropriate resources to really take a hard look at that preparedness plan and to update it and to expand on it. Ver very much as a result of what was happening in the world over the past X number of years, and I don't need to lecture anyone on what's been happening and what's been going on. And so the college decided, you know what, let's take a fresh look at this and let's really give this the 100% effort that it needs to make sure that we are doing all we can to provide the safest campus community that's possible, even though we all understand that there are no guarantees. And that, so that effort started last winter. And as part of that effort, we knew that there was going to be several key issues that would have to be addressed at some point. One of those key issues was whether or not the college would or would not arm our campus police force. So going back to probably February or March of last winter, we started the process of having those discussions. The first thing that needed to happen was the president, Dr. Jack Sprager, who you'll meet in a couple of minutes, needed to make the Board of Trustees aware that these discussions were going to take place and that the college was interested in, in exploring this. And after doing so, we started the process of vetting it through the college community itself. We held a couple of different open forums during the spring semester, inviting all members of the college community to come to them and to weigh in on their thoughts about this very important issue. One of those was an, an expansion of our regular monthly faculty and professional staff meeting where we decided to open it up to all members of the college community, including students, to hear from them. We also established a, an email address of preparedness which, where any member of the college community could just send in their own thoughts if they weren't able to make one of those meetings. We brought the issue to the student senate and presented it to them, who then in turn did some polling of the student body and as a result of that, the Student Senate then unanimously voted in favor of arming the campus police. Folks were also invited at any point during the entire spring semester to weigh in either confidentially, anonymously to the president or by identifying themselves. And we gathered a lot of information, an awful lot of information during that time. Many, many members of the college community decided that they wanted to weigh in and they did weigh in with their thoughts. I can tell you that although we don't have exact numbers, somewhere around 80 to 85 percent of the responses that we got during that period of the entire spring semester were in favor of arming campus police. But then this summer, as things progressed, and the Board of Trustees was, was starting to weigh in on all the information that our president provided to them, the issue came up that we also needed to invite the community in. And that's why we're here tonight, to invite your comments, your thoughts, your reactions to this proposal of, of arming our campus police. In a couple of minutes, Vice President of Administration and Finance, Steve Kenyon, is going to give you a short PowerPoint presentation on some of the important key issues around this topic. But before we get to that, let me introduce the folks that we have as our experts tonight who will field uh, most of the questions after the formal part of the evening is done. All the way on the end here, we have the retired fire chief from the Somerset Police Department, fire Steve department. Rivard. Fire department, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Fire department. <laughs> then we have the uh, retired chief of police from Fall River, Jack Souza. Good evening. We have the current chief of police from Fall River, Dan Racine. We have the campus's uh, director of public safety and chief of police of the campus police, Wayne Wood. Good evening. And we have our vice president of administration and finance, Stephen Kenyon. And be Stephen, Stephen Rivard. Yeah, Former fire chief from the town of Somerset. The, these folks have all been part of the, the college's larger preparedness team. 
So before we bring up Steve Kenyon to give you some of the, to uh, give you that PowerPoint presentation, I would like to invite the president of Bristol Community College, Dr. John Sprague, to come up for some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Steve, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bristol Community College. It's my pleasure to uh, serve as president of this great institution. And this is a very important discussion that we're about to have. I wanted to recognize first uh, some of our trustees who are here to listen in on this discussion. We have uh, Deborah Kenny uh, here, and uh, Joe Marshall is here, and also Cynthia Rose, the uh, vice chair of our, uh, of our board of trustees. Cynthia also is here uh, in her capacity as the chair of a special trustee subcommittee uh, looking into this grave matter. Uh, Vice President Ozog uh, mentioned, uh, and uh, we're all aware of some of the things that have been happening in society since, uh, well, forever, but uh, certainly uh, more immediately since December uh, last year it went the Newtown, uh, Connecticut tragedy. Uh, then we moved on to the Boston Massacre uh, tragedy, the Boston Marathon Massacre. Uh, just so you know, our, our uh, massage therapy team uh, was at the finish line uh, for that uh, marathon day. They go up every year and provide their services to the runners uh, uh, as they come across the finish line. Uh, so you can imagine that we were all very quite concerned about their safety and well-being. Um, and uh, I think cell phones had been shut down, I guess. I, I, so it was very hard to uh, uh, reestablish re contact with them, and we're all worried down here at... Uh, at Bristol Community College, but thank goodness uh, they were able to evacuate the, uh, the city in time uh, uh, after the explosion. They were there for that explosion. So uh, with these events in society, uh, it became uh, necessary for us to look uh, more carefully at everything that comes under the rubric of uh, preparedness. And in fact, um, in addition to his other duties, I assigned uh, Vice President Ozog to be our preparedness officer. Uh, officer in Chief of Preparedness. We haven't really got a title for him yet on that. But, um, and immediately, I'm so glad that uh, ch uh, former Chief uh, Steve Rivard and former Chief Jack Souza, uh, who are already on staff at Bristol Community College, uh, uh, sharing their expertise teaching for us, uh, were able to come together and uh, work with uh, Vice President Ozog and uh, the three of them plus our uh, uh, Chief of Police uh, Wayne Wood uh, set together a really, for lack of a better term, an executive committee on preparedness. The four of them and of course many others. Uh, you're going to hear from Vice President Kenyon as well. Um, so it's a very important issue. Uh, it's something that um, no one takes lightly and that really is the purpose of this meeting. We wanted the uh, community, we want to be good neighbors and invite the community to share in our, uh, uh, in our internal discussions. Uh, the Board of Trustees are here and they're listening. Uh, they have meetings and discussions. Uh, we've been talking about this many times across the uh, college community uh, ever since uh, Vice President Ozog uh, and I first spoke about it in January in the aftermath of the December Connecticut um, uh, tragedy. Uh, we've had numerous discussions on, on the campus uh, across the college, uh, uh, open forums, uh, meetings with certain constituencies, faculty, uh, staff. Uh, I've met several times, including this afternoon, with the student senate and the student trustee, who are the voices of our students, uh, our student body. Uh, the the uh, reaction, as uh, Vice President Ozog mentioned to you, has been overwhelmingly uh, in favor of arming the police. Uh, one of the things that struck me the most, and you'll be hearing about this uh, in more detail, I was firmly opposed to introducing arms on the, any campus uh, uh, <clears throat> throughout my 40 years uh, in, in, uh, in community college education. But uh, uh, with the onslaught, if you will, of uh, these public shooters and uh, uh, rogue mischief makers and beyond mischief to tragedy, um, it has struck me that our police currently, if we uh, we did some, uh, we did some um, drills, uh, and one is uh, aptly named the shooter drill. If someone, and essentially 
takes off from someone right now. Today we got news this minute that there's someone actively shooting, walking across the campus. Well, what struck me was that our, um, our police officers to serve and to protect, their first duty is to take cover because they're unarmed. They're no more uh, invulnerable to uh, uh, weapons than uh, the rest of our students and staff and employees. And that really hit home to me once we have faced with that stark reality. So uh, I am recommending uh, to the Board of Trustees as one voice uh, among many uh, that, uh, that we do go ahead with uh, uh, careful precautions about the arming. Uh, you should know that as president, um, I feel that I bear uh, you know, this terrible responsibility for the safety and well-being of our entire BCC family. And uh, under the current situation, I do not feel that we can discharge, I can discharge that responsibility uh, by inadequately preparing our police officers uh, to uh, be put in harm's way and to face grave danger. So uh, I want to be sure uh, that we have done everything realistically possible. I say realistically because, I mean, there could be millions and millions of dollars and every student have a, have a, uh, a guardian to travel with the person or whatever it is. But realistically, it's not, uh, you're gonna hear about the expense involved and it's not, uh, it's not something that is unrealistic to arm our police uh, within our budget. And we will uh, uh, you know, take the certain steps about the training and the psychological evaluation as well as weapon training. I don't want to skip ahead to the content of the meeting, but I want you to know my perspective as uh, president. I, I'm deeply concerned with the welfare uh, uh, and the safety and security of our entire BCC family, and that includes neighbors, and any, as you know, uh, people come to walk around our pond uh, to use the library from the community, not necessarily students uh, or any direct association with Bristol. So uh, that, that uh, certainly weighs heavily on my mind. And as I've told the uh, college officers, uh, God forbid if something untoward happens, I want to be able to look in the mirror the next day and say, well, we, we did all we reasonably could, or all we rationally could. Uh, that, that weighs heavily on me, and, uh, and that's the point I'm at right now. Uh, so, I'm going to uh, turn it back to uh, uh, our Vice President, uh, Steve Kenyon, uh, and uh, there's much more, uh, some brief information, but we wanna leave time for your discussions, and uh, please uh, do uh, make yourself available. President, I'm sorry, just one very quick question before we get sure. PowerPoint presentation with all due respect at six o'clock at night. Um, has the decision been made and will there be anyone speaking for the opposing position this evening? Because so far the ramp up and it's been quite eloquent. Well, that's my personal view. Okay. Uh, there'll will be there time be for everybody to speak after this uh, no, presentation. I mean from the college community, you've mentioned everybody favorable to this position. Yes. You have not mentioned that there's going to be any opposing view presented from, say, the podium. What's that? I will be. I will be. You will? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I didn't say over uh, unanimous approval uh, because there were voices, very, very uh, strong voices opposed to it, as there probably will be tonight. Uh, so I, I didn't want you to think this was, uh, uh, that was just personally my personal opinion about it. So I'm going to turn it over now to Vice President Steve Kenyon, and uh, we'll, we'll get this underway. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming out tonight. My purpose, or part of my, my role here at the college, is overseeing the campus police department and, and public safety. And with that uh, responsibility, I just want to explain to the, to the folks that are here that the the decision lies with the Board of Trustees. They've, through the legislative and our general laws of Massachusetts, they have the ultimate responsibility to decide whether this campus is armed or not armed. And the, the second bullet on this particular page uh, speaks to the Board of Higher Education, which oversees all the public uh, colleges in the state of Massachusetts. And, they did a survey that you know, ended up with about 30 recommendations, many of which we've done, 
and others that we're considering, and one of the ones we're considering is the arming of, of campus police. And what I wanted to do in the next couple of minutes, because that's all this, this presentation is, is just a couple of minutes, and it's just to put up uh, on the screen for your thought and consideration or the pros and cons. There are many of each. <coughs> I've tried to select a handful of, of both. And again, the point is just to get this group or this body of people to react and you know ask us any questions. And we have some very... Um, very informed uh, gentlemen over here that hopefully between us we can answer those questions or certainly take your, your points with us. And I mean, some of the ones are pretty straightforward, but the, the first one, I, I think, I mean, I often get a response from folks that they're surprised that our campus police aren't armed. And, you know, I, it happens more often than not. They're, they're shocked, you know, their children have gone to K to 12 and they have resource offices in, in most of the schools now. And when they come to college, they're surprised to see uh, police offices that aren't armed. And you know they've been through the same or very similar training as your municipal police, your state police. So in the, the other point I wanted to make, it's certainly in the, in the pro column, is the response time. You know, it's, you know, I'm sure the four of a police could, could be here in four or five minutes, but, you know, the data that's out there about these events, the shooting events on campus or in schools, is that they're over in four or five minutes. They, they don't last long. They usually end up, as soon as the, the shooter is confronted, they take their own life. And so the response time is, is certainly would be increased if our own law enforcement had, had arms. <coughs> the other, this, the second bullet, bullet actually is the, um, the the four of a police. You know, they're not as familiar with our campus. We have over a hundred acres here at this particular campus, with ten buildings and six hundred thousand plus square feet of space. Our offices know every inch of that space. They're out there every day, day in and day out. They know where all the the nooks and crannies are, and that just can't be expected of a municipal officer. That just it wouldn't be fair. And the, the last bullet I wanted to point out is, many of you may not know, but we have a, a very large campus in downtown New Bedford. And you know, safety and security is a prime concern to our students who are getting out of class each night at 10 o'clock. And again, this is just all working towards improving our preparedness and, and safety for them. And here, here are several arguments against arming. And, you know, several of, of these uh, uh, faculty have expressed, uh, some faculty have expressed concern over how, it's, how having guns on campus might change, you know, the, the feeling on, on campus and the collegiality that's experienced. And, I mean, again, I'm not like the others. I'm not going to read, read all these to you, but I, I did want to present these for your thought, and, and hopefully they'll prompt some, some discussion. The, the last bullet, you know, the trustees will consider several options. Uh, some schools have taken the approach of just having guns available or arms available in their campus police department, and they would retrieve them should an incident occur. I mean, there's pros and cons to that decision as well. So here are, here are several more, you know, that we've heard, you know, from the, the campus community uh, against the, the arming of, of campus police. We're trying to gather data on the first two, and again, the, the first two on this list go back to the, the K to 12. You know, the perception out there from our traditional students is that they've experienced this for the last 12 years in, in their public school. And obviously there's, whether you the, the last one, the potential liability, that was both in the pros and the cons. There could be liability in either scenario. In this, you know, this slide is just to put up some of what the next steps would, would, would be. You know, if, if we go forward, if the trustees do approve this, you know, we've already taken, you know, some steps to our policies and procedures and our, <clears throat> 
excuse me, our offices would need to attend firearms training, which has been offered by the four of a police department. And they would also undergo a psychological evaluation and both of those would be done annu annually. <coughs> so that's, that's it for my presentation. So I just, I'd like to open it up to any, any questions, concerns, thoughts. We, we really wanna hear from you tonight. Steve Ozug is gonna come back up here and moderate and I'm gonna go back and sit down and <coughs> try to answer the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Kenyon, and sit down and try to get your voice back, too. So the information that was provided here for you was really, hopefully, to, to stimulate conversation. But now it's your opportunity. We want to hear from you. We have microphones set up in a couple different places, so we'd ask you to approach the microphone. We'll, we'll alternate taking your questions. If I can answer your question, I will, but more than likely, I'll refer to one of the folks here. The purpose of having these five, quote, experts here is because we felt that they can probably most adequately answer some of the questions that might come up because we anticipate the questions could be very similar to what came up in our own meetings here on campus and that these are the experts, these are the people who work in that arena. So that's why they're here for that purpose. So it's, if you would go to the microphone, please. I have a question of uh, Chief Souza and uh, also a couple of comments. Uh, the first comment I want to make is that our family is split. Uh, my wife was a student here and graduated and I still go here. Um, her concern was not so much about arming the police but the possibility of them not being trained well enough uh, so that they would know what to do. Um, because they are a community police. I told them, don't worry about that. I, I personally know most of the people at the head table there, and uh, they will be trained, which is my question to Chief uh, Souza. Um, sometimes we train people when we're talking about arming them, uh, like in the service, how to shoot. But I'm really concerned about when to shoot. And then the other thing is, I wonder if Chief Sousa, you could comment uh, on the possibility, because I know you discussed this in Intro to Criminal Justice, which I took with you, mm -hmm. about how great it was when you were able to bring in tasers in addition, so you didn't have to escalate from uh, pepper spray to lethal uh, force. Okay, um, per perhaps part of the question could be uh, bounced over to the current Chief of the City of Fort Worth, Chief Racine, but I'll, I'll start the answer anyway. I believe that um, when we started discussion of this whole um, question of bringing arms onto campus and arming the professional men that stand in the rear of the room this evening, I immediately called my uh, former colleague uh, and um, go-to uh, person when he was my captain, lieutenant, and uh, eventually succeeding me as, as chief of police. Um, and had a discussion with him relative to whether or not the Fall River Police Department would um, accommodate the offices of the Bristol Community College uh, Police and give them the same expert training that the officers of the Fall River Police Department do receive. Now, I'm very familiar with what that training is because um, in conjunction with the assistance of then Captain Racine, um, we we're very, very much concerned about a critical incident occurring anywhere in the city involving an active shooter. And what we went ahead and did during my tenure, and I'm sure that it's continuing on with the uh, leadership of Chief Racine, is that we enhanced our training from just eight hours of training to requalify annually to a full 40-week course. A 40, uh, 40, not 40 week course, a 40 hour course, a full week course. And included in that course is um, every single police officer on the Fall River Police Department is expertly trained in how to respond to an active shooter situation. Uh, we went ahead and enhanced that training because trust me, um, during my nearly 10 year tenure as Chief of Police, uh, as uh, President Sprager is very much concerned about the safety and well-being of the students on this campus. I was just as concerned about the well-being of the 10,000 students in the fall of the school district 
um, because um, nobody ever heard of, of Littleton, Colorado, or Paducah, Kentucky, or places like that before there were shootings there. In, in essence, what I came to understand is that these incidents, although they may be anomalies, can happen anywhere at any time. And the best practice, the best thing for us to do as administrators is to be prepared, and as prepared as we possibly can. Now, to, to answer the question as to when to shoot or what um, acts in that decision-making process of an officer who is put in that particular position to make that very important decision, that would all be part of the training that they would receive. They would certainly be um, uh, expertly trained. The, the officers that are running the four of our police department um, uh, emergency response team, I'm sure it's a different name now, Chief? Uh, similar. Similar. I know, I know that a couple of changes have taken place, but um, it's their version of the SWAT team. Uh, the, the officer that is in charge of that, Lieutenant D uh, David Govere, is uh, absolutely one of the best tactical officers uh, probably in the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, he has come here to this campus. Uh, he has chatted with us. He has run drills with here with us uh, over the past uh, eight months or so. Um, so again, I'm very, very confident that in the event that the trustees do see fit to vote to arm our campus police, that they will receive uh, not only professional training, but training that I think that um, I know that I worked very uh, hard to, to make the best I could, and I know for a fact that Chief Racine has continued to make it even better because he's had uh, three years of experience as well as more technology than we had just three years ago. And speaking of technology, um, you asked a question about tasers. Now that is a question that did come up during the process of our earlier discussions on whether or not to arm campus police with firearms. Somebody said, well, you know what, maybe firearms are inappropriate. Maybe we should just think of just arming them with tasers. And I brought tasers into the Fort River Police Department 2008, somewhere. Um, I believe there has not been an officer-involved shooting since. There has not. So I'm a firm believer in that tasers do prevent um, officer-involved shootings. However, I believe that tasers, under the law, are only to be carried by officers who also carry firearms. I learned that tidbit from Chief Wood. Chief Wood uh, did some research on that because that question was brought up and Chief Wood said, well, that is an excellent question. Let's do some research about that. Let's see if we can just give our officers tasers and maybe you know, visit this question about firearms <coughs> later on. So I think that for now, I'm an advocate of arming them with both, quite frankly. Um, but this discussion, again, is arming them with firearms. Um, and I have received uh, um, back and forth uh, chatting with Chief Racine, um, his uh, uh, um, commitment to uh, bring these officers into the training that the four of the police officers receive. They would be trained just as, as exactly as the four of the police officers are. I think it's a good liaison to have with our local police department. Uh, as well as arming them with the same type of armament that the four of the police have. And uh, another issue is that if these gentlemen are on campus armed, the first responding officer from the four of the police department already has their backup here. They're already here. And that's a big issue that we discussed uh, in the past as well. Have I answered your question, sir? Is yes, you did, sir. Okay, thank you very, very much. Chief, I don't know if you want to add to anything to that. Speak into the microphone. Oh, you can't. I'm sorry. The only thing I have to add can you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> would be uh, the, tr the training they receive will not just be stagnant from the line shooting, you know, five yards, 10 yards, 20 yards. We train them scenario type situations. So situational training. What if this happened? What if that happened? And that's on the live firing range. At the floor of a police department, we also train in what's called a simulator room, which is very expensive equipment that we are offering to your folks to train in, and that is all scenarios. And many of the scenarios are do not fire. The scenario runs through, and the scenario, the proper response from the officer is do not fire. So we're looking to make sure that the officer understands not to fire. Although there are some scenarios where they should fire, 
there are many scenarios where we're looking for them not to fire, to understand the difference, the nuance. Obviously, there's nothing absolute about this. This is, this is dangerous stuff in real life. But in the, simu in the simulation room, many of the scenarios are designed for the officer to not fire. Another question? Yes, please. Um, there's a couple of questions here, if you don't mind, Chiefs. Um, let me see if I can understand. We're in an educational institution, so I'm assuming the decision was based on some sort of data, okay? So let me understand. Can anyone answer when uh, BCC was, was built here? When did it come here? This, this campus or when the college? The college this, this officially campus. opened in 1965, okay. and the first buildings here were built in 70, 72, 73. 72, 73, thank you. Okay. Um, this is the first time this has been presented to the public that you wish to arm the security officials here. Is that correct? Well, well, I would security call police officers. Campus, yeah, they are police officers. Security police officers, thank you. Campus police. All right, so this is the first time. So it's been 30-some years. Is that correct? Correct. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know the answers to these questions. So where I'm going with it is this, all right? What is the data of recent vintage that has propelled the data from this campus or another BCC campus in the Bristol County area, obviously Bristol County, um, that propels this decision, i.e., there's been a rise in crime on the campus, there have been rapes, there have been larcenies, carjackings, somebody has pulled a gun down here because that would be helpful to know. Has that happened? I'll be happy to take that one. That has been part of our discussion since last winter, and I can be honest in saying that it is not as a result of specific incidents or an increase in crime on this campus. It is more the discussion that evolved when we started to peel away all the layers of emergency planning and preparedness. And as was already pointed out by Chief Souza, many of the other places where a violent intruder has come onto a property or have come onto a campus and started shooting were also not, they were in the same situation. They were relatively tranquil places and they weren't responding. It wasn't because crime was escalating or violence was escalating. So this, these discussions came up here purely as, as the president pointed out in his opening remarks, as just another layer that we wanted to explore. Okay, so Should, exploring that layer, if I might, um, Okay, so there's another layer to explore. So we all know that at Columbine there was an armed police officer or security officer in the school at the time when the attack was going on, who, who and God, you know, God love him that he lived, but who unfortunately was not able to stop the attack. Um, we also know that in terms of the Boston Marathon and a horror, and a horror that that was, of course, um, sorry. Okay. Uh, there, how many armed police officers were there? I mean, I'm going to say hundreds, but I'm going to guess it was closer to a few thousand. So if we're using that as the data to support this decision, it becomes, at least for an educator, I would imagine, a little problematic. So can you just, if any of you can, connect the dots as to why, given Columbine, given Newtown, and given, um, I believe we're mentioning, it's been referenced, the Boston Marathon, why that logically supports this decision. And you may have a great answer for it. I just don't know the answer. No, that's, that data isn't necessarily what's driving our, our decision. It's, the, it's trying to prevent or put in everything we possibly can to put in place to prevent such an incident from happening on this campus. But, but we would understand, that given that logic, then we should all have tanks and Kevlar. I mean, all the students should be given uh, a Mac, a PC, a book, and a Kevlar vest with an AK-47, given that logic. Well, if I may, the yeah. students are not sworn to protect life and property in the same in the, in the same in the same vein as these gentlemen are yeah. these gentlemen are sworn police officers mm -hmm. and by virtue of the fact that they are sworn police officers they should be armed otherwise they shouldn't be called police officers so you are so Jack uh, Chief Susie if I may so your 
uh, solution or your belief, is that, if that's a better word. Your belief is that if you are a call the police officer, security officer, wherever. No, that, there's a big distinction between a security officer and a police officer. They're police officers. Oh, so they're called police officers, but they're not sworn as Fall River police officers. They are Massachusetts, under Massachusetts general law, they are sworn police officers in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and are trained as such having gone to a police academy. So why is it that they're not on already? That's a good question. Okay. So your, your belief would be that they should have been on from the 70s when this place opened up? Um, I, if I was asked in the 70s, of course, uh, I was probably in middle school, but um, I, uh, I, I, I I certainly would. I, I, there's no question that I'm an advocate of arming police officers. Uh, and if they're not armed, I think we should change their title to security guards. I mean, they're, they're, I think the expectation of um, folks who see a police officer and they have badges that say police, patches that say police, cars that say police, um, they are trained as such, and they have taken a, an oath of duty to, to protect. And as President Sprager said earlier, uh, in the event of a critical incident on campus that we all, of course, hope does not ever come to fruition, um, these men, and as, as my former uh, boss uh, and good friend Ed Lambert used to say always when talking about the police, the former mayor of Fall River, used to always say in, in the most dangerous of situations, it is the duty and responsibility of police to run toward danger rather than away from it. And if there was to be danger, these gentlemen would be well within their rights to be running just as fast away from it as everybody else under these circumstances. Absolutely. Okay. All right. that, that, that's good to understand. Now, having said that, it does beg the question, it makes me a little confused about the presentation, then I'll shut up with this, the presentation <laughs> of why now. If that's the belief that I know it's your belief and that's what you're presenting it as, but if that's not the reason, and the reason is not, as it's now being explained, not because of Newtown and not because of the Boston Marathon, and so let me try to let me try to clarify the college's answer to that when we say this isn't the reason or this isn't the reason I think what we mean is that there is no one individual reason it wasn't because of this incident or this incident or this piece of data it is a collection of all of the research and all of the sentiments and all of folks feelings about are we doing the maximum that we can and should do within the law to, to, to address all the issues of public safety. Well, so no to understand the research, or is to understand the research, if you might. I, you're saying that there is research that supports this decision. If you're saying the polling that was described earlier, is that's the research that supported this decision? One piece. One, what we did on campus was certainly one piece of, of the decision. But the information out there, as I think has been expressed quite well by a couple of folks already about police officers, sworn police officers. That's the research that I'm talking about. That a sworn police officer who is in the midst of a violent event of some type, who, who's expected to confront that and try to neutralize the situation, needs to have the tools in order to effectively do that. So we're talking theoretical situations because that's the situation have not come to play, at least not to the extent that they have been reported to the community at law. On this campus, I mean at Bristol yeah. Community College? That is absolutely correct. And that is what we found in, in having these discussions. That is a valid argument as to maybe it's not the best decision to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the one that's going to sway one way or the other, but that has been uh, professed by other folks also. That if you haven't had the incidents here, why are you doing that? And that's when we look at the collective picture. And as has been pointed out already, a number of other places had the same sense of false security, that it couldn't happen here, can't possibly happen here. But you mentioned the, set, the places and sense of false security, and truly my last question and comment, and we just talked about those places, the Boston Marathon, they couldn't have had more 
armed police officers added. Littleton, Colorado, that did have an armed police officer in the school. I'm sorry I'm not as well versed on this mm -hmm. But in any event, what you're suggesting as the remedy for reasons not because of the individual law enforcement, we're not at fault, mm -hmm. I'm not going there. What I'm saying is that even doing that wasn't sufficient to solve the problem. And what we're saying here is, well, it will solve it. We now see that there is a problem. And the way to solve it is the way that didn't solve it. I would there is a downside, which I don't think has really been presented, of introducing guns to a college campus that is not under siege. Unless it is. In response to that, though, I would add that I would ask everyone, not just you, not just me, and not just any member here, but I would ask everyone to consider the number of incidents, though, including the Navy shipyard, where the incident was over as soon as an armed officer arrived on the scene. That's part of the research also, is that when you have an armed officer on the scene, those incidents are over much quicker. And so one of the things that we've debated is, what's the response time? from our Fall River Police versus what's the response time if it was already here on campus. Again, what's that? It was mentioned earlier that it takes five minutes, which surprises me. Well, I'll ask either chief to give us what's an average response time from our Fall River At Police. At present, historically, shots fired in the city of Fall River, we respond to in four minutes and 50 seconds. Shots fired. And four minutes and 50 seconds. That's one officer to the scene. An active shooter at this campus would require more officers would require an enhanced response, different types of weapons. We have that roving throughout the city. We'd have to respond that here. Time is ticking. The four minutes and 50 seconds is an officer on the scene. As that time is ticking, I think the question is, what's acceptable? How much damage is acceptable? To me, none. I think this, these officers could defuse the situation quicker than us. And years ago, I think the answer would have been, the chief would have said, no, we're gonna come here. We're gonna defuse the situation. I think we have to think differently. We have to look at this campus as part of Fall River, yep. as part of the Fall River Police Department. If they can defuse the situation before we get here, they should. And Chief Wood, could you add to, could I just ask Chief Wood to talk about what is the response time to any incident on campus by one of our officers? Within seconds, we can get to any building. Uh, I know there's 10 buildings on this campus, but my office is patrolling randomly at any given time, and they can respond within less than 30 seconds, they can respond to any building. I do lousy math. It, it's 100 acres, but we're not utilizing all 100 acres at this time. And how many offices are you I usually have anywhere from two to four offices per, per shift. Can I just give you a little history about the security? When the school first opened up, they had contract security patrol the campus, uh, an outside agency that usually patrolled it was shepherds, German shepherds, and some also had armed. They also were armed. And then when the college went to their own private or police department, they hired within, like custodians and facility people. Now my guys are all required to go to the academy, all get the proper training, and with the help of Fall River PD, the state police, uh, we continue to do the training. And, and Chief Warden, thank you all for, for indulging me for a minute or two. I'm going to sit down. That's why we're here. But, um, please uh, don't hear me saying anything disparaging about your officers. Oh, not at all. That's not where I'm going. Okay? All right, thank no you. problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Others, do you want to go to the microphone, please? And I apologize. Earlier I said I, we had two microphones. We have the one in the center. My mistake. Just, just a couple of thoughts. Um, these are police officers, is that correct? Yes, um, it is. I don't think this is on. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. No, I was saying that these are police officers. And uh, am I right in understanding that they do not have firearms training? They don't have firearm training right now. Some of my police officers are already reserved officers for other towns, and they do have the firearm training already. Oh, I guess I'm a little ignorant because I kind of thought that all police had firearms training. That's well, what I thought. See, the college, when we went to the academy, the college didn't require us to be armed, so we didn't get the training. So after we graduated, the, the colleges and universities that are already armed, they stayed for the extra two weeks for the training at the academy. So we're not armed at this time, and we didn't get the training at the academy. But that is what would have to happen if this right. decision was made. They would go yeah, for that additional training. To me, um, when I see a policeman on the street, even uh, tra uh, you know traffic officers, they, they always have a gun. So, all right, and I think um, some of this is a societal issue too, because 
You know, for example, I was in Israel last year, and wherever you go, there are soldiers with guns. I mean, you go into a museum, and there's a soldier there with a gun or, or sightseeing, and, and it's very common. I don't think anyone in Israel would question going to public places and seeing either soldiers with guns or police. But, you know, over here at BCC, it's, it's a little bit scary because, like you said, it's, it's very serious stuff. It's dangerous stuff. So I think the whole thing is to weigh the risk, you know, of having police who are not armed. And like you said, an incident could happen anywhere in the world, anywhere. Nobody is uh, immune from it. Or, you know, having police with guns and, you know, making, you can't be 100% sure, but the question of, God forbid, you know, a gun going off or them reacting in a way that they shouldn't, you know, because we, unfortunately, there are cases that you, know, you see on television that I know I saw an incident uh, on TV a, f a few months ago, I think, or a couple of months, where a man in the middle of the night, his car broke down and he, he went to get some help and the woman got so scared she called the police and according to the TV report, the man was shot at so many times, you know, when in, in fact, he, they didn't think he was guilty of anything. So you're, you're kind of afraid of, of, you know, maybe a human error somewhere. So it's a, a fine line and it's very difficult to, I don't have the answer, you know. Thank you for your comments. Before we take another comment or question, I do want to recognize we had another member of our Board of Trustees show up since we did the initial introductions, and that is Patricia Andrade, if you just want to acknowledge. Thank you. After you, Liliana. Hi, my name is Liliana Gagliardi, and I'm a neighbor. Um, I enjoy coming to your uh, campus because I use the library and I walk around your beautiful pond. Um, I feel very secure in here. But my question is this, because it seems that a lot of people here are very apprehensive about guns and that. I wanted to know what kind of a protocol you have if something happens. And the other thing is, I wanted to know if the policeman or the teacher and professor are trained to... Um, study the students that might have problems. Because usually it's always somebody within that does the damage. So I think that it's very important for the police officer and the, and the community, the teaching community, to be able to recognize um, someone that has either mental problem or other problems. Okay. So I, I, I want to... You know, to know this. All thank right, you. thank you. I think you have two parts to your question yes. there. I'll answer the second part okay. about what the college is doing to try to identify potential dangerous people, and then I'll turn it over to someone at the table to answer the piece about what are the protocols if something were to happen. The part about what we're doing to identify, several years ago the college put together what we call a threat assessment team. It is comprised of about eight or nine different individuals from the college uh, most of whom have particular expertise in an in, in aspect of identifying that type of behavior. And what we ask the college to do, all members of the college community, is to, keep, to make us aware, make the team aware any time you encounter or experience any member of the college community acting in a way that just raises your concern. It may or may not amount to anything, but we want that information fed to the threat assessment team, and we do get that information on an ongoing basis. And the team gets together every time something comes in, and we evaluate that, and we try to stay on top of. And most of the time, it simply involve, has involved, up to date anyway, it has involved monitoring that person to make sure. There have been a couple of occasions where we have actually been legitimately concerned about this person, and on at least one occasion, we've asked the person to leave the institution. Uh, but at the same time, making sure that they're getting some kind of help on the outside also. You never want to release a person. You never want to just set them free if you think there may be a problem or they could be dangerous, and now you have no idea what's happening. So we always try to tie it into some help on the outside. But most of the time, it's, we end up monitoring the situation, and, and that's how we're trying to stay on top of it. But as several people have already said, there are no guarantees. 
We know that. We're yeah. trying to do the best we can, as many cal colleges are. A threat assessment team 20 years ago was unheard of on a college campus. It's now becoming standard, a standard piece of, of college operations. So that's the second half. The first half, I'm going to turn it over to either Steve Kenyon or Wayne Wood. Or I'll try it first. Uh, basically, it's tr called training. I mean, it's tra a lot of training. My guys know the campus, know the, know the students, where we know what we're dealing with. Uh, we also have a policy and procedure book in, in, that we go by. There's also a continuum of force when dealing with a, an altercation. We always start off verbally to try to diffuse it, but we have our own continuum where we have to, if we have to increase, we increase the, uh, what we need to do. Uh, but like I said, it's all about training. We're going to continue to train. We have Fall River no nearby that's always helping us. We also have the state police that helps us. We also have other community colleges, other, other universities that are always calling us. I have a network of myself of all the chiefs in the area. We meet like once or twice a month. We talk about certain issues. So it's something we, we do address daily. Uh, and like I said, my, my officers know, the, know this territory. They know the buildings. They know the students. And with that, if we have a threat or we have a concern, then we go over to Vice President Ozog and we, we, we go from there. I, I, I am very confident about your police officer. One of your police officers is a neighbor of mine and he's the best neighbor I could have. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Who will go unidentified right now? <laughs> Just a quick question on, on your answer there. What have been your threats or your concerns? You say you meet twice a month or so with other colleges? Yeah. yeah what we, are some major concerns or major threats that you feel? Well, the threats here, we, with, with Vice President Oda, we do the threat assessment team, and we meet right away. But what but would be, what would you consider that, a... Uh, most of the college right now are talking about active shooter. They're all discussing the issues about active shooter on campus. But what have uh, you experienced? I mean, you talk about it, but has it been an active shooter? Has it been... I can take a shot at that, Wayne. Okay. Take a shot at that? No pun intended? <laughs> 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 Sorry, bad <laughs> choice of words. <laughs> Should I duck? <laughs> I, 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 we made it through this far without one of those bad choice of words. <laughs> For, I'll give you a couple of examples. Very often a faculty member, and maybe more than one faculty member, will come forward and say they're working with a student and the student seems to have an obsession with violence, mm -hmm. talks about it all the time, sp uh, speaks about it from their past, brags, well, maybe brags the wrong word, but goes on and on about perhaps a previous life that they've had, you know, where they've been involved in crime and violence, and maybe they've, they've come out of that now and are leading a different life, but they seem to have an obsession with it. So that would come to us, but you know, I'm really concerned about this person, there seems to be. Sometimes it comes through writings. Very often, uh, especially in an English class, where students are asked to, to write freely about their life and their experiences, and very often this stuff starts to come out, some really, really deep stuff. So much so that a faculty member may say, you know, I'm really, really concerned. We don't know if there's anything here, and we haven't had anything yet that has risen to the level other than that one student that we asked to leave. But even that, it didn't rise to the level where we felt there was an immediate danger. Mm -hmm. In that case, we felt this person really, really needs a lot of help. They need a lot of help, and that's why they were asked to, to leave and to get that help because it was, they weren't able to succeed academically until they got that help. But most of the time, it, I mean all of the time, it has not risen yet to the point where we really think we have a violent person here that we have to, be, we have to take action against. But that's okay. We want the college community to inform us about that. We have mental health experts on the team. We have a, a consulting psychologist on the team. We take all that information and we try to digest it as best we can, balancing always the rights of the individual to an education with the college's obligation to provide as safe as an environment as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And so if I understood correctly, there are two officers on duty like two to four at any two given time. Two to four at any given time. And ship. are these the same officers in the cars, or is there is there a... Yes, they either do uh, foot patrol or uh, vehicle patrol. So they're, are they in the buildings or out of the buildings? In, in out, out of the buildings? through the parking lots, in the buildings, first floor, second floor. So two to four, and each would have a gun, or does, are you expecting... Each? It sounds like the gun's in, so... If it is, they all would be armed. They each would all be armed. All campus police officers. So it, they'll drive with a gun, they'll walk with a gun, they'll stand with a gun... Exactly. It'll I be just a want to clarify that point, though. It's not a done deal that guns are in. The Board of Trustees <laughs> has, <laughs> has voted favorably to arm, but the arming could be other. It doesn't necessarily mean a sidearm or a firearm. It, so what else would it be? Paul? That's what other point. options are available? Know. What else other than a gun might they carry? Well, we, we gave one example already that they may Easy. not carry. It could be that 
arms are on campus, but they are secured and only accessed if needed in an incident. Okay, so great. I, I missed the very beginning, so I think I missed some of those good points. Yeah. So the trustee, the Board of Trustees will meet again and vote on this. Is that, that's the end when that happens? Correct. And that will be, when will that be, do you know? Is there a- One of the trustees member one? I don't think there's a deadline date at this point. Yeah, there's, no, there's no set deadline. They, they meet the first Monday of, of each month, and it's been an ongoing, ongoing conversation. Tomorrow, we wanted to. Thank you. We wanted to have the public meeting first, and we are going to meet tomorrow. There's several members of the board, plus the chiefs, plus the vice presidents will be there, and then I would make make a recommendation, whatever my committee decides, to the full board, and then the full board would vote on it. And they would meet when? The next meeting for the full board is December December second. And you. You're thinking they'll be voting on December we're, 2nd. We're not sure. We're, we'd like to try, but we're not sure because we have to have this other meeting tomorrow and maybe another subcommittee meeting after that. We're not sure. So then if that happens and they meet on December 2nd and they vote to go forward, they will be armed in whatever manner that's decided. Right, at what after point? the training and after the weapons are bought, absolutely. It wouldn't happen right you away. You must have a timeline. There's got to be some timeline. No, I don't, no. no. There's no timeline. Yeah. No? no? No. Once, if the vote is taken and it is approved, there is a timeline bef between that time and the time the officers would actually be armed, if that was a decision, and probably Steve Kenyon is best to answer that piece of it. Yeah, w once the trustees decide, I, I would anticipate it would probably take five or six months to complete all the training, psychological evaluations, and make sure our policies are, are what, where, we, they, where we want them to be. So if I'm a very concerned neighbor who really thinks this is a bad idea, would I then maybe write a letter, call someone on the board, and just continue to voice my opinion and, and those who have the same opinion of mine? Or is basically this your one-shot deal to voice your opinion and then it goes you know, through the process that it must go through? I would recommend that anyone who feels on either side of the issue that they would like to weigh in, that they write to the president, and the president will ensure that that information gets to the Board of Trustees. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Steve, I think you've been waiting. <laughs> thank you. Three ladies went ahead of me, so I'd be happy to let another. Um, I, I'm sure that you can imagine that it's somewhat uncomfortable for many of us, and particularly speaking for myself, it's uncomfortable to see such an austere group of uh, gentlemen sitting in front of us and, and, and coming to the microphone with a point of view that I know is not in keeping with all of yours. And I know all of you and have worked with all of you in various capacities through the years, and I do come from a perspective of having a bias toward not having guns. Um, in fact, I have in this week that we uh, recall the assassination of our beloved John Kennedy, uh, I think that we all recognize what violence has done to our society and how it's taken away, at least from my perspective, back then 50 years ago, took away my innocence and my uh, belief in Camelot. Uh, and ever since then, it seems like there's a continuing escalation of violence and guns in the hands of so many people. And I suppose if having guns in more people's hands would make me feel more secure, then I would probably be the most secure person in the world because there's probably more guns in more people's hands in my country, in our country, than in any country on, on the planet. And yet I don't think people are feeling more secure and more comfortable with their own peace of mind today uh, because there are more guns in more people's hands. And having said that, I have the highest regard and when I'm having trouble in property that I may have or feeling threatened, I want a police officer there and I want him or her to have a gun. I want protection. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I, as much as my bias is not to have guns, I appreciate and understand the importance and the good work that all of you do. Uh, and so I come perplexed 
And I come here also as a staff member of this college, which is just a wonderful place, and, um, and we're led by the greatest president that you could conceive of. And I know this weighs heavily on him to make this decision because he's a thoughtful man and he wants assuredly the best for the campus. Uh, and so I come to a place where I'm concerned about how we have come to this point. When I attended the first meeting, um, when we were going to discuss this in H building in the theater, I said, well, good, we're going to have a discussion. And I thought, as Ms. O'Neill alluded to initially, well, who's the con and who's the pro? And I, and I thought that that's what I would come to in the auditorium, is a balanced approach where we begin with objectivity. And yet, with Chief Ravad, Chief Souza, our campus chief, and Chief Racine was not uh, present, I believe, at that first meeting. But it was unanimous presentation of guns should be given to our campus police. There wasn't two people of equal stature, whether they be faculty people or administrative people or community people, that might have been at the panel so that there were two and two. Two people and maybe alternating, one speaking in favor another one speaking in opposition, another speaking in favor, another speaking in opposition. Those of us, and again, speaking just for myself from the campus community, felt, I felt, wow, I'm up against some pretty hefty characters there. Uh, three chiefs and a, um, and a supportive administrator. Do I dare speak out in opposition to them? And of course, being the fool that I'm, I, I did, you know, and I do again. So. I just think that when making such a momentous decision, that the place to start is from objectivity. That we don't know the answer to the question, whether it's better to have guns or not to have guns. We don't stack the panel with one perspective and then try to argue against that perspective. Because it already creates a us versus them rather than a we situation. We need to make a decision as to what's best and ultimately the board of directors and the, and the president of the college need to make that decision. But at least from the community input, from both the college community and now from this, the community, we're approaching our opposition as being us against them, and I, and I just don't think it's the right approach. I would prefer, and I, and I don't think this will happen, but I would hope that the Board of Trustees would take that into perspective when they meet and say, you know what, let's hold off. There's no great urgency to make this decision in December of 2013. Let's go back and find within our campus people that are in support of our police officers carrying guns and those who are opposed to our police officers carrying guns. And then let's have a debate, a healthy democratic small d debate about the value of having guns on campus. <clears throat> I would also like to know the facts. I, I, I read with interest a letter to the editor from one of our faculty members who say, just show me the facts. I understand, as was mentioned by Councillor O'Neill, that there were weapons by police officers at Columbine. I understand at Virginia Tech, there were also people with guns, officers with guns. I understand that at Camp Hood, is it? A military base? Fort Hood? There were many people with guns, but yet it didn't stop an individual, a lone gunman, from doing dastardly deeds. So I think that that tells me that guns on campus don't stop bad things from happening. So, and I think that, that we would all agree. And, I, and I, I would also be interested to know, and I'm sure that this data is available somewhere, but how many times does someone who has access to a gun, a military person at Fort Hood, 
or an officer at a particular institution. How many times does a situation occur where an officer might use the gun inappropriately <laughs> or because of some difficulty bringing back to the workplace from home? We know that there are profiles of officers who have difficulties in domestic situations. Does that create another situation that we don't want to see? I think all of these things make me think about there should be a better way, and that better way ought to be from objectivity, it should be from a point where we don't come into a room with a decision already predetermined, or at least perceived by most of us as being predetermined. You may say, no, it's not determined, we're still thinking about this, but we feel it's predetermined, that this, will, this is just going through the motions because you, you need to, and it's a good thing to do it, but the inclination is to support arming police on this campus. Uh, I remember, again, I'll mention as a kid, I remember that I used to hear about London in England. I, unfortunately, I've never been there. Uh, but uh, those officers only carried bobbies at one time. I think that's, they were bobbies. They only carried sticks. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I used to think, well, that must be an interesting thing to be in a country where your, your police officers don't carry guns. I'm sure they carry guns now. I expect that England is a very different place now. Not sure. They don't? Well, it's interesting. England doesn't carry guns. Police officers don't carry guns. Because the people don't have access to guns like they do in this Like they do here. So maybe what we ought to be doing is thinking about how do we de-escalate the carrying of guns? How do we make it so we live in a society where there are fewer guns? I work, Steve Ozog knows this, uh, Esteem Toffa knows this, uh, on issues of prejudice reduction, violence reduction, conflict resolution. We've been trying to get some money to work on these kinds of issues, but we know that money is, not, is tight. How many dollars that are going to be spent on weapons might be spent on conflict resolution, violence reduction, on, on, on dealing with prejudice and, and, and root causes of violence of one against another? How can we get to that place how can we use our resources in a, in a, in a way that isn't about, about escalating the use of guns? How as a society, I often think, how as a society could we fund an educational system the way we fund our military system? So that we take dollars, and I'm a big fan of Bonnie Franks who talks about how can we channel the Pentagon funds into education and to the needs of our cities? And how would that reduce violence? if we could make sure that people are clothed and fed and have decent housing and decent health care. I know we're going to a bigger issue, but I think that the issue of deciding about whether or not more guns is going to add to more security is an issue that ought to be revisited and revisited from a point of objectivity, a point where a panel is presenting pros and cons, and then let the college community, and then let the Fall River community, and I'm a member of this neighborhood, let us then go forward from that point of objectivity. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. As always, we appreciate your comments. Just a point of clarification for those in the audience here. The purpose of the panel was not to present. The purpose of bringing these folks here was because we thought that they could answer technical questions that nobody else would be able to, and that's why we didn't have them present as such, and I understand that it does appear, based on who they are and their status, I mean, their, their, their opinions on this matter, that it may be one-sided, but that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was other people couldn't answer some of those technical questions, and those were the experts that could answer those. Yes, Joe. Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing. On the uh, committee, uh, Is that only small people? enough. I work for FRC. Yeah, yeah all right. Wait, that's right. He's got to have a job. Um, I'm on the, the committee, and I just want to reassure you, there's four members of the committee, two or four, two or against. So you're represented on the committee that's going to present the, the, um, the recommendation to the college. All right? I don't know if that helps. Thank you, John. If, I'm, if I might, is that all right, or should I? 
Okay. Go right ahead. There's Thank no you. If I might, I mean, first and foremost, I think everybody is well-intentioned. There's no question about that. And I do believe that you all have the concerns of your students at heart. And that's, there's no question about that. The, the problem, and I'm going, to ha I'm going to echo Councillor Kamara's um, observation, the problem is that it does appear that this is a done deal. And I know that that's not what you intend, but that's what is being communicated. So I would further echo a comment that he made about how this, perhaps there's a better, better model for this, and there shouldn't really be a rush to decide this question. So if you really want to debate this issue and you really want the community invested in the decision, then I suggest to you a true debate with those who are in favor and those who are opposed, and not just within the Bristol County community is perhaps the model that should be adopted. Let me please respond, okay? Sure. I, I cannot let stand the implication that this was not a long, lengthy, debated process. Uh, I, I'm very sorry, that Steve, that you have that impression. We had endless forums, not just that one time in the theater. And uh, when you say it is a done deal, it's because 85%, my guess, 85% of the comments were all in favor of arming. I don't want to say that there was... No, I don't want anyone to say that there was no objective debate. There was uh, opportunities galore for people to make known, even confidentially, if you didn't want to stand up in a public meeting and be identified in one point of view or another. I always, since I got here, I've had 24-7 uh, uh, emails and voicemails, uh, confidentiality guaranteed to make known your views. And Steve, if I could, uh, I came away, now maybe it's unfair, I came away and you said something about it tonight, I came away from what you said that day at the theater is that we should make the, uh, society better. Society is violent and I couldn't agree more with you. I absolutely agree with you. But in the meantime, we can't put our head in the, in the sand. You were concerned, I am absolutely concerned about Newtown and Boston Marathon. 13 miles away, the bomber was here the next day. So I don't know where you got the idea that these events, society is violent. And uh, all of these... I'm not, President, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm not t taking your point. I'm not, I'm not understanding you, with all due respect. And yeah. I would further point out that if this model that's being presented and what Councillor Kamara has described as the previous model of the uh, auditorium, whatever, if those were the models that were being presented for a discussion, I mean, you, it, that is, it's really more of a steamrolling, with all due respect, and well, I mean yeah, that. Open hearing. But honestly, yeah, you've got an open door, and the, that's the fine. Model, excuse but me. You've got well, an open we have open hearing. All of these hearings, people could get up, as you are today. Everybody, this is an open hearing. Uh, and uh, uh, we want to hear... The, uh, we Dr. don't want to hear Dr. about uh, other than a question that you might have. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Sprague. And that's, and that's my point, that yeah. this is not uh, uh, some ramrod rushed decision, which I'm hearing you say. Yeah. We've, this is an extent from last January, and it's moving with <coughs> uh, all deliberate speed to uh, reach a consensus. And it's not at all a done deal, as uh, uh, tr Trustee Marshall uh, just explained. Yeah. The, the committee is split. And uh, we don't know what the final decision will be. Well, then I be. think it would be helpful, perhaps, to the committee to not have just somebody like myself who just happened in here tonight, I happen to be a neighbor, and has some comments to make. It would, be, it would make more sense to have a gun control advocate and a gun arming advocate have a debate for the community, and not just people from BCC. You want people from BCC hearing it, but you want to have somebody who is a gun control advocate. I, well, you're not hearing the other side here, and there is a certain I'm, there is a certain intimidation factor which none of these gentlemen are trying to do intentionally. But believe me, it comes across that way. So, with again, and I mean it, with all due respect, there is a better model to decide this, and it's not a hard model to implement unless there is a foreshortened timeline, and it is a done deal. Well, I don't believe, I believe that these forums are the debate you're seeking. And, and so far we've heard from two or three people that are absolutely opposed. Uh, and uh, so what is your, uh, you know, what are we to, to determine? And, and when you say that there's, uh, that there's no guarantee 
uh, once we arm the police, there absolutely is no guarantee. And, you, and you, it doesn't do, in my mind, it's not helpful to bring up incidents that didn't work because there were armed people there. It, it all depends. Life happens out there. What I said at the very beginning was that we take all realistic steps to help secure the safety of our BCC family. And, you and there said, are no doctor, guarantees about it. Of course. And you said, doctor, the reason, or at least it's been mentioned a couple of times, the reason to take these steps you described and others have described as Newtown and the Boston Marathon, and not using the name, but referring to Jokar Sanev. Those are the reasons. And now you're telling me it doesn't make sense to use those. I, I'm not understanding your point, with all due respect. Okay, but again, if you really, you know, if this isn't just check it off the box, we want to say we had a public hearing and some from the public came and spoke, and, and I, I might say thank you, I do, I, I do appreciate that, it was well-intentioned, but if you really want to do this with all due respect, again, right, let's have a real debate on whether or not you should have guns here and not just have a few neighbors come in who, when I bring kids down here to walk around the pond or to go to the internet cafe, are now going to have to be worried about an armed police officer here. I get, you know, if there were terrible incidences going down here, I might have to rethink it. But I've heard no evidence, no data to support that mindset. All I've heard is Boston Marathon, Newtown, and any one of a million things going on. I mean, there was, I don't want to be flippant, but there was just a typhoon down in the Philippines. Should we all start, you know, getting weather? Well, anyway, I, I withdraw that one. But I'm <laughs> getting off the point, I'm sorry. But you, I, I, I do mean this uh, sincerely. If you want to do this right, if you want the community invested in the decision, do it right. Thank you. Excuse me a second. I just want to add, the, the meeting that uh, Mr. Kamara had referenced, it did have a former mayor of New Bedford, Scott Lang. He was on the panel, and he was providing opposing views to the Army. Well, I've got to take exception. Yeah, but let me, let me make my point. Yeah, Robert, Robert was up there already. Okay, I'm a student here. Today, when a fellow student said, why don't you go down and see what this is all about, I started looking around the classrooms, and I realized that if I was in a classroom, I wasn't going to be depending upon my great professors to protect me. I want you to get armed and soon. And Steve, I, I assume you have a comment, but before you do, I just, just a clarifying point for the folks in the audience who weren't part of those previous discussions. The reason we brought former Mayor Scott Lang in was because he has become an expert on this subject, both pro and con, and he actually does a speaking circuit now where he outlines both the pros and cons of this. So we brought one person in who could present both sides, and the two sides that he presented that day are what uh, Vice President Kenyon outlined for you in the PowerPoint presentation tonight. We thought that would be a very expeditious way to get that out to you. Here are the two sides. We don't have to spend a couple of hours debating it. Here are what the experts are saying are the pros and are the cons, and we just wanted to give you that right up front and let you now respond to that. So just a point of clarification. Yeah. You know, in the, big, in the big picture, this is not going to affect my life one way or the other, whether there are guns held by the police officers behind me or not. I, 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 I do not expect and hope that they will never be in a position to have to use them to protect me. But, you know, having said that, you're right. I, I, didn't, I didn't think about the mayor, but the mayor was a proponent of police officers carrying guns. He may have presented, as you did today, uh, Steve, uh, well, there are too many Steves here, but uh, <laughs> Vice President Kenyon, uh, as you, you, you did uh, present some pros and cons, uh, the mayor presented pros and cons and then firmly said, but I am a proponent of police officers carrying guns. And, and, and that's my point, that at least that, which I think was the first sort of open campus-wide meeting to come to discuss uh, this issue, that the panel consisted of two police chiefs, Ravad and Souza, one campus police chief, and one former mayor of a, of a city uh, nearby, New Bedford. Uh, I've known Scott for a long time, uh, and, and, but yet he and the three of you that were there on that day was a, a very cohesive panel that was pro-police officers carrying guns. And I don't think 
from the perspective of someone who was going to thinking that he was going to a meeting where pros and cons were going to be discussed and debated in a, in a very classical debate format, that didn't happen. And the president's right. His door is always open. He has many opportunities for chat with the president, both anonymous and, and, and making yourself known. So it's not a question about whether there are open doors or closed doors. It's about whether the process in making this decision is, is, is the process that began from a point of objectivity. And I, and I submit that it didn't start from that perspective. Thank you. Oh, you have been waiting back there. I have. I thought you just didn't want to sit any longer. I'm, Sorry. I'm here now. Okay. Uh, the state boards that oversee BCC, uh, do they take a position on this? Do they recommend that the officers be armed? Vice President Kenyon can answer that. Yes. The, the Board of Higher Education, which oversees all the public uh, community colleges and universities, they did a survey and it came back with about 30 recommendations all related to public safety, many or, or most of which we've implemented. Uh, number 10 actually was the one on arming campus police and, and they were um, in favor and recommended arming campus police. And do uh, the other colleges and universities in the Massachusetts system, are they currently armed? Many are. There are some that are not. And what are the reasons the ones that are not armed? I don't want to speculate. I'm not sure. Uh, they may all have their own reasons. Uh, but I, I can probably add a little bit to that. We don't have the definite answers, but uh, co recently coming from a statewide meeting with my colleagues from across the other 15 community colleges, many of the ones who have not armed to date, for the same reasons we haven't been armed. It just didn't seem like anything that they needed to be thinking about. But I can tell you that 201, they are all having the same discussions now. They are all talking about the same things. It is on the agenda. There are currently a couple of other community colleges that are armed, but every other one is are having those discussions in some format. Very good. I was, talking to, I was at a conference yesterday, and I was talking to someone uh, from, an, from one of our sister institutions, and they actually sit next door. The campus sits next door to the police department, so they're in a different situation. It literally is next door, but they are having an officer on campus 24-7 now. Uh, one, of the, one of the actual town police officers armed on campus all the time. So they're not, they're not, it's not a college officer, but it is an armed police officer on campus. Other thoughts, comments, questions? Yes. I'm a na neighbor and also came in late, but my question is just, simple. what is the rationale for arming the police? And that sounds like it's already been dealt with, but I just, I did get my notice as a neighbor. What is the rationale for arming the police? I think it's been pointed out a number of times this evening that there is no one individual rationale, but I do believe that there is probably one that is overarching and probably rises to the top, at least for all those folks who are in favor of doing this. And as you see, it is not unanimous. But for those who are advocating this and in support of it, one of the overriding issues is that we have sworn police officers, academy-trained police officers on our campus. They are, they are police officers, but they are not armed, and yet they are expected to respond to any violent incident and neutralize that incident, but they, have, they don't have the tools that they need in order to do that. That is one of the overarching uh, uh, principles, but there is no one. I can't tell you that there's one that's swaying it this way or the other. Many, many things came together to cause the college to want to discuss this and to look, take a look at it. Are these recent events in the last year or so kind of propelling this forward? Because I, I just, I was aware of it generally, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's stating the obvious, but is that what it is that you're dealing with these un predictable individuals roaming around now? Again, I'd be lying if I said, yes, it was because of Newtown that we're doing this. No, but it has been a slow, steady escalation over time as we have looked at so many factors. In addition to what's happening out in society, just our own growth of the campus and the fact that we have, we're approaching 10,000 students. That's a small city. And that's a town. And we have police offices in the town, but they don't have the tools, and that's what's driving a lot of people towards towards pushing for this decision. Okay. Thanks. Can you get to the microphone again? Thank you. Okay, by the way, my name is Sylvia Eisner and I, I work here too. I'm a tutor in the ESL lab, the reading lab. 
And nobody hates guns more than I do. And nobody is in more favor of gun control as I do. And I'm assuming that the policemen up here are concerned about gun violence in this country. Um, I'd like to ask, well, maybe Officer off Souza, uh, for example, in Newtown, let's say that there was a police officer there with a gun. My own feeling is that I think maybe the carnage could have been less. Do you, do you agree with that? Um, yes, I would. Uh, certainly not knowing, I'm sorry, my microphone's not working. That's okay, I hear you. I'll, I'll speak loud. Um, I, I understand, thank you. I guess somebody shut me off purposefully. <laughs> uh, not the first time. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I understand that Newtown was in fact an elementary school in um, um, a, a, a smaller elementary school. Um, we're dealing here again, as you yeah, are well aware, with 10 buildings, so it's a little bit different. Um, and I was just trying to bring I, the I do principal. believe that in the event that there was an armed police officer on staff, formally, um, formally referred to as a school resource officer, at the school in, in Newtown, Connecticut, that perhaps the carnage would not have been as significant. Perhaps that individual who chose that particular venue for his carnage, knowing there was an officer there, may have chosen not to, to pick that school. Um, there, there really yeah. is no way of telling in, in looking back uh, on, on, in hindsight. Um, so, uh, you, you know, we, we've had for many years, many, many years, uh, um, officers in the floor of the schools. Uh, oh, what about now in the high schools well, and middle schools? Are, are there? Well, you, I'll let Chief Racine answer that question for you. Okay. Are there? Um, there are. There are officers in the high schools, both high schools, uh, Diamond, Durfee, and the uh, alternative school. And, and there they are, are officers. Armed. They're armed. All Fall River police officers are armed, of course. Yes. But these, they're not. They're not Fall River police officers. These are campus police officers. Okay. Um, well, I think, and I listened to Mr. Kamara and, uh, very closely, and, I th and what he said about gun control and the fact that guns uh, are very often in the hands of the wrong people, but that's, not, that's kind of not what we're talking about now. Correct. If I the police officers had them, we're, hopefully, you know, they're... They're in people that should have them will have them. Have them. I, no, no guarantees 100%. But like I said before, I think you have to weigh the risk of if something does happen, it could happen anywhere, not being armed or, you know, having them armed when something does happen. Certainly, I too am a very strong advocate, as I'm sure my colleagues here are, of gun control. But when I think of the term gun control, I certainly don't think that in any stretch of the imagination is applicable to taking guns from police officers. Right. You want to enhance gun control, you put the guns in the hands of the authorities that are going to go out there and stop guns from proliferating in this society. So when you use yeah. the term gun control in applying it to police officers, it just yeah. is an oxymoron. I, I, I think so. And it just, uh, just an aside, as far as, and I read quite a bit about the Fort Hood situation, I believe that there were Marines there at the site that this man went in and, and did his carnage, and I believe they were unarmed, the, the Marines. I, I'm not familiar with Okay, that thank situation. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I think as folks can see, this is obviously a very, very important and a very hot issue. And I just want just to kind of bring closure and to summarize, despite what anyone might feel on either side, this is not a done deal. You've heard the facts about where the Board of Trustees is at this point. You've heard the fact that there are two people on the subcommittee in favor, two opposed. We are a long way from getting to a, a final decision here. This was an important step in the process, the process that started back last winter. 
and we will continue until there is some decision one way or another. And I'll reiterate what I said a little while ago. Anyone who still has a comment they'd like to make is welcome to send that along to the president at the college here, and he will make sure that that gets into the hands of the Board of Trustees. Thank you, everyone, for being here for tonight and participating. <laughs>